So we are very happy today to have Alisa Goodman as the next keynote. Uh, Dr. Alisa Goodman is a Robert uh, Wheeler Wilson Professor of Applied Astronomy at Harvard University and a research associate of the Smithsonian Institute. Dr. Goodman research and teaching interest span, uh, interests span astronomy, data visualization, prediction, and online systems for research and education. Dr. Goodman received her undergraduate degree in physics from MIT in 1984, her PhD in physics from Harvard in 1989. She was awarded the Newton Lacey Pierce Prize from American Astro Astronomical Society in 1997 and became full professor at Harvard in 1991. Was named a fellow of American Association for the Advanced of Science in 2009 and she was chosen as scientist of the year by Harvard Foundation in 2015. She is also a PI uh, of GLU, the open source Python library for multidimensional link data exploration, as well as co-founder and president of GLU Solution Inc. So without further ado, I give the floor to Dr. Alisa Goodman. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, it's really fantastic uh, to be here. I've actually never come to JupyterCon before. People from my group have come, um, and I've heard it's really fun, and I've been here for one day, and I've had a lot of fun. Uh, so thank you already very much. And so let me try to give you something back um, by telling you a little bit about astronomy and a little bit more about how we use Python and Jupyter and visualization tools in general. Uh, to, as it says here, see the universe more clearly with glue. And I just have to say that I'm going to show you the work of about 100 people, and I couldn't put 100 names on my slides. Um, so this is just a disclaimer that at the very end, there's a subset of those people who have contributed to a, um, a Google directory of sort of Jupyter things uh, that has a bunch of the examples that I'm going to show you with notebooks um, and readme files. So if you want to play around with them, uh, please be my guest. And of course, I'll also show you the links to all the software that I'm going to show you. And I always put all of my talks online. I have not yet put this one or its link online because I'm hoping that I don't see people with their laptops open. So not yet. If you don't keep your laptop open, you win possibly a prize that's in this bag, of which there are like 30. So you have good odds. OK. So um, uh, I think that Sylvain Corlet, uh, who Fernando and I and many others here are working with in order to make glue into Glupiter, would like me to change the title um, here. And so there really is a Glupiter. It really is coming soon. Its name really was approved by the Jupiter board. So thank you for whoever's on that board and did that. OK, so here's my whole talk on one slide. And I'm guessing that this is not clear um, at the moment. But hopefully, by the end of the next, uh, I don't know, 40 minutes or so, it will be clear. And I'm just going to show you a little bit about each of these things that's shown in the picture. And you'll notice that in the middle, uh, there's a giant glue icon, because I'll have to say that my talk is kind of essentially presenting the motivation of why did we need this software in astronomy, why are people using it in genomics and also in medicine and some other fields, why will it be better uh, if we connect it all up with Jupyter Lab? And how can you help? Uh, and then the stuff at the very bottom is for discussion. It's uh, things that we can talk about if we have time. And then here, uh, I just wanted to tell you that sort of my overarching goal in life, and this is a tribute to my dad, who was a transportation engineer. So I once gave this talk where I talked about the road from exploration to explanation and being able to go both ways in terms of software tools and visualization. Usually, if you go from exploring your data in a fancy tool to explaining it to the public, it's a one-way street and it looks really nice at the end, but you can't go back to the original data. We want to make it so that you can go back and that you can go back and forth. And so if you just keep that in mind through the whole talk, that's kind of what we're trying to do um, with all of these tools. So um, raise your hand if you're actually an astronomer. I'm seeing gonna no hands, maybe. Oh, a few, like six or seven. Hi. Oh, Martin, hi. OK, Martin Bertels here has been very involved in many of the tools that I'm going to show you. He's one of the 100 people, but he's near the top of the list. OK, so anyway, about astronomy. Um, 
This is an odd picture here on the right, and on the left, you may or may not know what that famous diagram is, but I'll explain both of them to you in a minute, and I'll explain them to you in these two concepts that I need to get across of why it is that we would care so much about three-dimensional software that can um, uh, let you explore many different images and spectra and other kinds of data all at the same time. And ultimately, it boils down to something that you could call deep projection. So going from 3D to 2D, or projection, sorry, that would be projection, 3D to 2D. Deep projection is 2D to 3D, um, and color. And by color, I don't just mean the color that you see here in this image, but color even that your eyes can't see. And the reason for showing you this particular image, which by the way, I took, I was walking along the canal to um, the place called Stalingrad. Somebody can tell me later why Stalingrad is in Paris. Um, but anyway, uh, what you see here is an image that if you just stare at it for a minute, you, having lived in the real world, probably understand that this is some cool fence-like thing made of rope, right? The rope is blue. And that's some distance behind it. There's the wall of a building, and the building is made of bricks, and it has some glass, and there's a bush over here. And you're getting cues to that because you've lived in this world, OK? And you've seen these colors, hopefully. Probably about 10% of you are colorblind, so I, forgive me for that. But anyway, you, you figured out how to tell what a brick is and how to tell what a bush is through some color that you perceive. And you know from kind of perspective views and kind of how big things are intrinsically how to judge distance, how to judge depth. In astronomy, this is a much more difficult problem because let's say you're Galileo, which is the story I'll tell you on the left, and you have not been to Jupiter. By the way, I'll explain that Jupiter is spelled with an I in just a minute. Um, so anyway, uh, you can't take the kind of cues from everyday life and have that be reliable in astronomy. So actually understanding distance and depth and three dimensions and also understanding color and the meaning of color, and again, by color in astronomy, I mean every wavelength, not just colors that your eye can see, that's a very difficult challenge. Okay, so as I said, Jupiter, I'm sorry, but spelled with an I. I sometimes do spell it with a Y, especially if it ends the word glupiter. Um, but anyway, what I wanted to show you here just as a quick little a uh, teaser to the wonderful world of integrated tools in astronomy. These are just two different tools. This is Aladdin Light and this is Worldwide Telescope, uh, both of which can let you explore the universe and see Jupiter uh, in 2D or in 3D. And just for, because I knew there'd be five astronomers here, just so you know, um, these are just two examples and, and uh, there are many, many other tools that connect through Originally, a tool called SAMP, which is part of something called the International Virtual Observatory. You can ask me, Alliance, you can ask me about that later, or GLU. So GLU, which you'll see in a few minutes, has a big plug-in architecture, and all of these various tools, not all, but many, um, can connect to them. And so uh, let me, I'll, I'll open Worldwide Telescope and try some live demo in just a second, but let me explain what's going on over here. So. How many of you have read Galileo's classic, Siderius Nuncius? Zero. No Latin for you? A one. Wow. Congratulations. I can't see your face, but I'll talk to you later. Okay. Um, so this is a notebook, okay, a very interactive notebook. We used a pen uh, to write it, and it's actually the version two of his notebook. Version one was much messier, but I didn't show it to you. Um, anyway, and what Galileo is doing here is Galileo did not invent the telescope, as many people think he did. Um, instead, he was the first person to use a telescope to look at the heavens. And he noticed that Jupiter had some friends next to it, which turned out to be the moons of Jupiter. He thought they might be stars or some other planets or something else, and so he drew them here as stars. And what this is is a time series. And so this is the 7th, the 8th, the 10th, it was cloudy on the 9th, the 11th, the 12th, et cetera, of January in 1610. And he wrote this up in Siderius Nuncius. And what happened was this was the best evidence for a central massive body with small things going around it. So he used it, as did many people, as an analogy to say that Copernicus was right and that the planets actually go around the sun rather than everything going around the Earth. So this was very upsetting to the world, okay? But what I want to show you today is how unbelievably easy it is to see this in 2D and 3D along with anything else you might want to see in astronomy. So this is a program I had the honor of, of helping uh, create way back in 2008 in its original version. And so this is just Jupiter on the sky, 
Okay, so this is just an image of the sky that you might be familiar with. But what we can do today is we can say, no, no, I'd like to see the solar system, and I'd like to see Jupiter in 3D, okay? And then I would like to understand if Galileo was watching, if I go back to the sky here, let me do that, and so we'll go back to Jupiter. I can turn on time, and uh, we can actually watch things move. And it's gonna be hard to set this up in real time, so I'm just gonna recommend to you that there are these things called guided tours in Warwick Telescope, and one of them shows you this whole story in a very narrated way. But what I can do is, by the way, I could click this button and see the same thing in yet another program, ESA Sky, but instead I'm just gonna turn on time here, and I'm not even sure that the moons of Jupiter, well, you'll just see the moon moving through the stars, I don't think I have the moons, the ability to turn on moons in the 2D view. But anyway, Jupiter would have moved night to night on the sky for Galileo. But what he saw, so let me go back here and explain how this 2D, 3D thinking works. What he would have seen, and let me exaggerate the size of things ridiculously so you can see better. So what he would have seen is, you see these little dots? I'm going to turn off the orbits so that it doesn't in your way of seeing what's going on. Okay, so now if I turn on time and I make it go really, really fast, you'll see these little dots. Hopefully you can see them, okay? Those are the moons of Jupiter. And so Galileo had these snapshots viewing Jupiter kind of from the front like this, saying, oh, two were over here, one was over there, two was over, what is going on? And in his head, he had to do this. So can you see the little tiny dots? And now I will turn the orbits back on. I'll turn on the moon and satellite orbits. Um, so there you go. Okay, so you can see the orbits of Jupiter's moons. And by the way, those are just the four so-called Galilean moons. They'll come back into the story in a minute. But so, you know, he had to see something just going back and forth on the sky and infer that there were things actually going around in three dimensions. So this is a particularly simple and straightforward example. I'm gonna show you some other astronomy examples, although not too much, um, in a minute and later. Um, that'll show you, again, the motivation for this software that connects three-dimensional views and two-dimensional views. So I'm going to show you just good, no lap, oh, one laptop open. Okay, that person doesn't get a prize. It's okay. I'm sure they're playing with Worldwide Telescope. It's fine. Worldwidetelescope.org, sir. Have a good time. Thank you. Okay, so uh, this is my graduate student's hand, and you would not long believe how long it took to take that picture that looks like he's holding the dome of the Harvard uh, Observatory uh, in his hand. And, uh, but you get the idea. It's this kind of illusion that you see very often. And astronomy does this to us all the time. And we have a lot of kind of outreach videos, and I chose this particular one because you'll see later in the talk it combines three different software tools in order to make it, but it also gives you a nice quick three minute narrated view of why we care so much about this in the modern world instead of in um, uh, Galileo's time. So let me just play this for you and hopefully the sound will work. Uh, let's, yes, there we go. Okay, so this is from 2021 and it actually also relates to augmented reality which I will explain to you later in the talk but for now you just get to see it on the screen. The sun is just one of the Milky Way galaxy's billions of stars that we look up at every night. Despite how the night sky looks here on Earth, the stars that make up the constellations we see are almost all at different distances from us. Let us focus in on Perseus and Taurus, two constellations that obtained their names from Greek mythology. Looking up at these clouds from Earth, our eyes don't see anything special but infrared images reveal giant clouds of interstellar gas and dust. Perseus, artificially shaded red here, and Taurus, shaded blue, are as famous among astronomers as they are in Greek mythology, because parts of the dense clouds located near those constellations are collapsing to form hundreds of new stars. While beautiful, 2D views of the sky from Earth can fool us, an illusion called forced perspective where Perseus and Taurus look like they touch on our night sky. But do they really? Thanks to new measurements from the Gaia Observatory and powerful new data science techniques, it's just become possible to map out star-forming clouds in 3D. Let's look at Perseus and Taurus in 3D, as if we had the superpower to fly around in space. 
the clouds actually lie at very different distances. If we also look at lower density gas, shown here in white, we see that there's a spherical cavity between the clouds. Clearly, our 2D view from Earth of Perseus and Taurus wasn't giving us the full story. But how did this cavity and the arrangement of the clouds come to be? Astronomers suspect that about 10 million years ago, a powerful supernova went off, creating an explosion that pushed interstellar matter outwards. Remnants of this explosion are still visible today in the shape of the clouds surrounding the Perseus-Taurus supershell. The Perseus and Taurus clouds are just two of a dozen clouds whose structures and locations have now been mapped out in 3D. As astronomers continue to study and map other star-forming clouds near the Sun, they are sure to gain more insight into the history of our galactic neighborhood. Okay, so for the people here, this page may be the most important part of that. So if you look, um, let me just go back to that ending page. Whoops, just do that quickly. Hang on. Don't worry, we don't need the sound again. Whoops. I just want to show you that list. Stop. Here we go. Okay. So first of all, there's a lot of more people even that are listed here, but you can see the software stack. Okay, so that was not a cartoon. Only one little section of that was a cartoon. The rest of it was um, completely data-driven and produced by this lovely combination of software. Okay, so that's all I'm gonna tell you strictly about astronomy today. I'll show you some more examples in a minute. And so I thought I should get on to the point here of what is glue. And a few months ago, we actually made this video that doesn't show any fields data or any data at all that just explains glue as fast as we possibly can. So instead of showing you something like this, which is a screenshot of an astronomer using glue and having all these different kinds of 2D and 3D things connected to each other and different data sets and different tools, forget that. Okay, and I'm gonna show you the, the two minute uh, really quick introduction. So the first thing is I have to give Chris Beaumont, who wrote the original code for GLUE, credit it is not an acronym. Chris does not like acronyms, okay? It actually glues together data, glues together different kinds of graphs, and glues tools. And of course, it's entirely open source. Basically, everything I'm gonna show you today is somewhere on GitHub, thank you very much. Okay, and so the kinds of data that it can glue together, is basically any kind of data that you can imagine, and you'll see in a minute that there is a plug-in architecture where you could write a loader if your particular kind of data is not supported. But importantly, this goes from one to two to three to four dimensions, any kind of data you want, okay? And then the thing that apparently is the most unique about glue is that it's not just that the plots are glued together in a kind of tableau-like way, but the actual shared attributes of the data sets are glued together so that when you make displays of them or you do things with them, the software makes the transitive links and knows what to do. And in fact, we've recently added things that aren't even one-for-one uh, -one or algebraic connections, but you can actually join on key um, in some cases between certain kinds of data if you're interested in clustering algorithms, thing like that. Anyway, so if you do this, you never have to merge the data files and make, well, waste a lot of time uh, creating some master data file. So instead, you just load all the files at once, and then you can make um, pretty much any kind of graph uh, that your underlying graphing software or library, so in some cases, matplotlib, in other cases, a lot of IPy widgets and things, um, but anyway, any kind of statistical graph you're interested in, maps and images, and three-dimensional displays, including volume rendering, okay? Which again, is different than your sort of business analytics software because they're not so interested in three-dimensional rendering, okay? And if none of that does it for you, you can also have whatever kind of specialized chart you want. And the really important thing is that the selections that one makes when exploring data in one graph uh, propagate across to all the other data sets. Okay, and that lets you have uh, the ability to do really real-time exploration and learn things, okay? And then in terms of gluing together tools, uh, like I said, there's a plug-in architecture. You can 
include web services even in the desktop version of Glue. So Glue, the word Glue refers to the original desktop version and also kind of the whole ecosystem. And Glupiter is various forms of, of Glue on the web that I'll show you later. Okay, and so you can plug in these web services. And you can also, again, if you prefer the command line, still no one has their laptop open, excellent. Okay, but if you're the kind of person who was typing code while you're listening to me, Thank you for not doing that. Um, but you can uh, use the command line uh, in the middle of a glue session. Oh, and by the way, you also, you'll see in a moment, can save session files. Okay, so you can customize glue as much as you want. And so again, the three meanings of glue is to glue together data, graphs, and tools. And then there's the, but wait, there's more moment, uh, where, as I said, hinted just a second ago, when you're in some state of the GUI, a lot of problems with programs like that arise from not being able to save that state or not being able to edit it manually, but you can save a session file, which is reopenable and also human readable and editable. Um, you can export the graphics to any kind of format you want, including augmented reality, hint, hint, I'll show you later, um, but also Plotly, and um, you can use uh, Jupyter. Okay, so that's the end of that very short introduction. But I haven't told you one more thing um, that kind of is part of the history, okay? So what is this thing? Okay, this thing is, I'm proud to say, the first 3D PDF that was ever published in Nature, and I can open it during the questions if you like, but for now, just believe me that if I click on this figure, I can move it around, same thing with this one. But the trouble is, if I say, see these little billiard balls? Those are telling you about features in these tree diagrams, these so-called dendrograms. So if I wanted to like highlight part of this dendrogram and see that highlight in the volumetric image, I could not do that. Not with the software we used, which was called astronomical medicine, um, or with the 3D PDF. So that kind of interaction between the plots was not possible. But that's critical, as you just saw in that um, yellow highlighting. Uh, in, the, in, the, video, in the, the demonstration. So the issue is not only were we interested in this, we realized pretty early on that there were many other branches of science where there were very similar challenges. And in the life sciences, they also deal a lot with three-dimensional data that they want to connect to tree diagrams and statistical graphics. So these two examples are just shown here because they're particularly parallel. But what we're really talking about in general is interest in high-dimensional or uh, multivariate data challenges. And I should explain that while this is a sort of spatial graph, this actually isn't, that's not important here, it isn't, but it doesn't have to be. In other words, when I say high dimensional, I don't mean literal spatial dimensions, it can be that, but it could be many tables of an economic forecast, forecast. okay? So anyway, what we wanted was for all of these things to be able to talk to each other and getting back to the story about interactive publications from yesterday, I'll say a little bit more about that. So this is a PDF, which was not that easy to generate, very easy for users to consume, but not that robust over time. It does still work, but it takes a little effort to get the right version of Acrobat, okay? But again, what we were trying to do is let people go back and forth from exploration to explanation. And this is pretty good, but it was 2009, and we can do better. So that was kind of the culmination of this effort that was called Astronomical Medicine at an institute at Harvard called the Initiative in Innovative Computing. You can ask me questions about any of this infrastructure later, but for now, let's just say that at roughly the same time was when I had the honor of working with my colleagues, Curtis Wong and Jonathan Fay at Microsoft Research uh, to help create uh, Worldwide Telescope. And so I kind of knew that there was this future world coming, and I wrote this paper that I didn't think I was going to have to write after giving a talk in Germany where my colleagues told me, oh, you have to write a paper. It turns out it was useful to write that paper because while I was writing that paper, I was invited uh, to Space Telescope to say something. That's the Space Telescope Science Institute, for those of you who don't know, is the organization, part of NASA, that runs the Hubble and the Webb Space Telescope, and it's in Baltimore, Maryland. So anyway, I went to visit my friends in Baltimore, mostly to talk about Worldwide Telescope, but I wound up being asked to go to Matt Mountain, the director's office, and I go into Matt Mountain's office thinking he also wants to talk about Worldwide Telescope, and instead he hands me this half-done paper, this 2012 paper, so you understand in 2011 it was not done, and he hands me this draft and he goes, uh, Alberto Conti showed me this. Um, if I give you a million dollars, can you make this real? 
Okay, so there was sort of a proto version of glue described in there that Chris Beaumont needed for his thesis and that Tom Robitaille, who many of you know from the Python world, had helped to create when he was a postdoc in astronomy. And it was really kind of a graduate student postdoc level experiment at that point. And he's like, no, 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 we wanna give you NASA level money. Um, so they did, and eventually Glue became, a, and in its Python, Jupyter Notebook and, and Jupyter on the Web form that I'll show you in a few minutes, um, became the sort of official data visualization software for the James Webb Space Telescope. So we're pretty proud of that. And it was Arfan Smith, who some of you probably know from his GitHub time, who was at that point the, essentially the chief data scientist uh, at Space Telescope, he said, oh, we want to do more and more in Jupiter environments. And so honestly, the origins of Glupiter go back to Arfan Smith saying that they wanted that for the Webb telescope. I think, Fernando, that was when I first asked you if we could use that name. And it goes to Eric Tollerud, for those of you who know him, for that particular pun. OK, so fine. So now we've gotten up to here. And you say, well, what is this thing? OK, so this was again another attempt at this explore explain world. And it's in something that's called the paper of the future. And again, don't do it now. I promise I'll put the slides online. But you can just Google the paper of the future and you'll get what I'm about to show you here. Um, so in this paper, there's a lot of technologies that are demonstrated, um, including this particular one. And we wrote it, Josh Peake and I were the main authors. And, and uh, we wrote it for the American Astronomical Society who wanted to know what new technologies they could adopt in their journals to make them more useful to authors. And amazingly, after we did this in 2014, um, they adopted all of them in 2015. So everything I'm gonna show you today is actually allowed in the American Astronomical Society journals. Okay, so anyway, I'm not actually gonna do a whole demo unless you ask me later. I'm just gonna tell you that the platform this was done in is called Authoria. And it's, it's very similar to some of what we saw yesterday in terms of MIST. Um, it was bought by Wiley, but it's still available and, and widely used in biology. Anyway, in that paper is this plot, and I guess I do have to open it to show you what it actually does. Yeah, I should do that. Okay, I'll do it. Um, let me show you what that plot does. So if I, by the way, this one is like a Python notebook to recreate this thing. Okay, so here, if I just pick one of these things. This is an interactive graph inside of the paper. Okay, so the paper is written in Markdown, or you can write it in LaTeX, you can download it as PDF, et cetera, but you don't get the interactive figures if you do that. By the way, this little peak over here that says 1600, 1610, those are the Galilean moons of Jupiter. Remember, I promised I would show you, and you'll see there are these huge outliers in terms of their mass. Okay, but what's going on down here is this is, you know, in a normal paper, you'd have like figure one, C figure, then figure two would be C figure one, and there'd be some story where you present the same data over and over again, but this was a little sort of storytelling thing where you can um, interact with each view. So that was considered very ahead of its time uh, when we did that in 2013, um, and we did it using uh, D3 JavaScript tools, and there was a special little tool called D3PO, and so Glue used to ex ex export to uh, D3PO, uh, which could then be ingested as a JavaScript into Authoria. Okay, but now Glue, thank you to my friends at Plotly, uh, easily exports to Plotly uh, as of something about 2017, so we wouldn't use D3P anymore. D3PO, that's very hard to say. Um, but uh, it's a pretty fun uh, ecosystem where you can have this tool that any graph that you have open, you can just export to Plotly immediately and then share that with your colleagues or put the interactive plot in a paper or enhance it and then put it in a paper, which we often do. Okay, so here's where I'll show you a few examples of what you can actually uh, do and what you can actually learn with glue and in some cases Plotly. And let me just say one thing about, I, I really chose a very small number of examples, but this one here in green, um, this is gonna be a very big result that I'm moderately confident to say will appear in nature later this year. Do not send any pictures or do anything or they won't publish our paper in Nature, okay? So like I'm gonna have to remove stuff from the slides when I post them, but just stay tuned for what that is in a minute, okay? And the software that I'm gonna mostly show you is Glue, but I'm also gonna show you little touches of something called CoSpaces when it comes to augmented reality. Um, uh, this is the logo of OpenSpace and, and Worldwide Telescope. 
But let's start with uh, what was the cat and what is the New York Times article. Um, so this is my cat, and uh, my cat is walking on a, on a copy of a printed paper. One of the pages, by the way, this you are allowed to scan if you want. Again, this will all be online later, but if you want just this page with all of these QR codes, you can scan this, and this is the equivalent of a paper handout of what can you do with this software as of a couple of years ago, because I want to show you the new stuff too. But anyway, so this is just different static views from that video that you saw earlier today, uh, or earlier a few minutes ago, um, explaining that there's this giant cavity in space and that we were deceived into thinking that two of the things that are actually on opposite sides of the cavity were sort of touching each other. And you know, we tried very hard to make that a decent 2D figure with all these different views and slices, but really the very best way to see it um, is either in an interactive figure on the screen or in augmented reality, which I'll show you um, as a video in a moment and which I will be happy to demo uh, later. And then this over here, I'll get to that in a moment, but this, I'm not gonna ask how many of you saw our, our pride, uh, pride uh, or, or, or proud accomplishment, I should say, uh, in the New York Times last year, but we, we actually discovered that all nearby star formation is on the surface of this huge cavity, which is much bigger than, than this bubble. This is the Perseus Taurus shell, which is this one. But again, I'll get too, too astronomy-ish if I tell you too much more. Um, and this is the Radcliffe wave, which was another discovery in 2020 that relied on glue as well. But let me just start here with um, the Radcliffe wave and just show you kind of what does that look like if you are in the middle of um, analyzing it. Well, you know, it looks like a mess to people who are uninitiated, um, but to people who love these data and uh, understand what this means, this is fabulous. And so let me just simplify it by saying that this big long list of things is a lot of different data sets being combined all at once. Some of them are three-dimensional, some of them are two-dimensional, the observations are taken at different wavelengths, and um, it's a joy uh, to be able to just connect them all up, okay? And then what you see here, which is really important, is you see some data highlighted in different colors, some red and some pink, and that's showing you the same data, even in this Worldwide Telescope plugin down here, selected in one view um, and then interactively, instantly appearing as selected in another view. And so that was actually really critical to our understanding of the Radcliffe wave because what we were doing was messing around with these points. By the way, the Radcliffe wave is a feature of the local arm of the galaxy where the sun is almost in it and it has a gigantic wave pattern in it, like a huge sine wave. And by the way, we didn't know that it was oscillating and we published that paper in Nature and the only critical comment from the referee is, why are you calling it a wave? Is it really oscillating? And the secret result that I'm gonna show you in a few minutes is that it is oscillating. Okay, but anyway, we were just talking about the structure here and its context in the galaxy, so it was absolutely critical to be able to just drag the points onto the canvas and say, oh, I'd like to see that in context of everything we think we know about the structure of the galaxy in Worldwide Telescope. And so that's accomplished through this plugin architecture. And just to emphasize, what you're seeing here is a screenshot of a desktop application, but this is a web application, Worldwide Telescope, and the um, selection tools work across the web plugins um, as well as the desktop ones. Okay, so how hard or easy is this? Well, just for fun, I'm not really gonna explain, but I'm just gonna tell you that this is this, uh, we were, like, you don't know this probably, but you know, we try to be cool scientists. We're like, oh yeah, we don't really care about the media or whatever, but if your stuff gets covered in the New York Times and the Science Times, that's it, you can then quit, okay? So after this, I was like, all right, I'm quitting now. All right, but anyway, so um, uh, Dennis Overby appreciated what we did, and I frankly kind of didn't think he cared when he called me to ask me questions, because he calls me to ask me questions not infrequently, and uh, then I was very surprised when this article came out a week after everybody else's article. But anyway, you can go read about it later, but today it's about, it's about glue, and so this is, this is still the world of Zoom. So the first time we saw this was February of um, 2021, and what you see here is literally the first glue experience where we could see what was going on, and so this red thing is the Radcliffe wave that the three of us, so this is Joao Alves, Catherine Zucker, and me, 
um, with our colleagues had figured out a couple of years before. This is the Perseus Taurus shell that you saw a few minutes ago, and then this is this huge thing where you can see that all this sort of white fluff is on the surface of it. But you understand, all we had to do to see this, so Catherine Zucker, those little green spinning clouds you saw at the end of the video before, she was the first person in her thesis to ever make three-dimensional maps of individual star-forming clouds like that. And so all the three of us were doing was like, hey, I wonder where those all are in context of each other. And oh, Catherine said, I have this map that Kostov Das sent me of the local bubble. And so we're just dragging these things in. And then they all fit together like a hand in a glove. And we were pretty amazed. So um, that's why we saved that recording of, of the glue session. Okay, so what is this thing? And isn't my cat cute? That's Leonardo, by the way. Um, da Vinci, not DiCaprio. Okay, so <laughs> anyway, uh, so this is the paper that I showed you, this Perseus Taurus paper. And this thing is called a merge cube. Just raise your hand if you've seen one of these before. Uh, yeah, okay, Sylvain, you don't count. Okay, so anyway, so basically no one. Okay, so this is about, I'm trying to play with it so you can see how light and squishy it is. Okay, and I do not work for the Merge Company. This is a disclaimer. We, we are partnered with them at this point, but uh, certainly not when I first discovered this. And I should explain that the reason I know about this and care about augmented reality, et cetera, is because one of my other quests, that because this is not strictly a visualization talk, I'm not taking the time to explain, but I'll just say it in case any of you are interested. 3D selection, so in other words, instead of drawing a lasso on a 2D image and having it be maybe a magic lasso in Photoshop or something like that, doing that in 3D when it's not a clear threshold, when you wanna do it kind of with your hands or shape it in some intuitive way, is an unsolved problem in computer science, okay? And a lot of 3D manipulation is very difficult also. So I'm always interested in kind of new technology. So we have a lab where I have all this expensive stuff, HoloLens and all of its cousins. And we've been trying to look at 3D selection and 3D interaction for a long time. And then there was this pandemic. So I started buying toys and seeing if I could remember how to code and this kind of stuff. And so I had like a Sony PlayStation that I never had before and a PS4 controller for my Apple TV. But the best thing I bought was this $15 object. And let me show you why. Okay, so what you see here, this is a video just showing you somebody interacting with the Plotly export of this Perseus Taurus paper. And you understand that the point of this paper is to see that when you turn the data a particular way, two of these clouds look like they touch in 2D, but they don't in 3D. Okay? And so the best ways, and by the way, if you scan those codes with your phone, again, don't do it now, um, you can see this on your phone. Okay? So one is the kind of augmented reality you might be familiar with, you know, where if you're shopping online and it says, see it in your room, you know, this is that kind of augmented reality, which, which can be essentially native on your phone. The Apple phones are a little bit better at it, but the Google phones are fine, okay? But this is my personal favorite, okay? So I can actually put the data on here and kind of hold the universe in my hand. And then the really fun part was after we experimented with this $15 device and partnered with um, Eugene uh, Belieff, who runs a company called Delightex to use something called CoSpaces, which is that software I told you about, um, to actually make this look nice. Uh, and ultimately, by the way, so it came from glue. There was some, I think, Pi Vista or something involved. I don't remember. And then it goes ultimately into CoSpaces. But pretty much you can make a 3D printing format show up there, and the trick is, is adding something that looks like transparency. Okay, so anyway, we have since gotten a grant from the National Science Foundation uh, with the American Astronomical Society and Delightex and colleagues in Switzerland and Northeastern, uh, so that's Arzu Cheltiken and Michelle Borkin, for those of you who know those people, um, to actually make this possible for all authors in all uh, American Astronomical Society journals and probably journals beyond that. So I really think that's the future of publishing. Okay, so now I showed you the cat and the local bubble stuff. And so let me just tell you about the Milky Way in 3D. So raise your hand if you know what this building is on the right-hand side. You've been to New York and you don't know what that building is. That is the Rose Center and the Hayden Planetarium in New York City. So I think JupiterCon will go back to New York someday and I officially volunteer to show you what I'm about to show you. So my friend uh, and colleague, Jackie Faraday, and also another friend and colleague from the American Museum of Natural History, uh, Carter Emmart, 
Uh, we were with Tom Robitaille and Tomah Bach and a bunch of other people at a dog stool meeting a few years ago, just before the pandemic, and we talked about what it would be like if these tools, Worldwide Telescope and GLUE, that already talk to each other, also talk to open space, which is the immersive 3D environment that can be used on a desktop, but is also used in planetarium domes. And so I'll spare you the what was connected to what and who did what, but let's just say that all of those tools are now connected to each other in a way that you can run them on a, on a local machine, you know, on a laptop even, or in a planetarium. Okay, so again, it's glue, open space, and worldwide telescope. And yes, you can take data from your screen and look at it in the planetarium, but you can also be in the planetarium and mess around with the data. And I have been incredibly honored that my friends at the Hayden Planetarium have given us, in a collaboration, access to an 80-foot across dome to just play with our data and see what we can do. And so what we're trying to do is build the best map of the Milky Way in three dimensions uh, that we possibly can. And this is a joint research and outreach project. So the same data and the same tools, remember the two-way road, uh, that are being used to explore and understand the data and even you know, make calculations and models based on it, the same thing can be used in an outreach capacity, including even in a planetarium show. So what this looks like is this is Catherine and Micah who uh, are looking at a laptop, and this is the dome of the empty Hayden Planetarium, and they're getting things all set up in glue and uh, using the open space plugin. And by the time you have it all in there, this, by the way, is a star catalog that was added. All those little dots are from Hipparchos. You can see uh, star clusters, not Hipparchos, when we're saying Gaia. Uh, you can see clusters of young stars. There's the, the local bubble and the Radcliffe wave. And this is just an iPhone video of the dome of the Hayden Planetarium. But so this is the kind of thing you can play with while you're sitting there. And then the other thing you can do, which is kind of amazing, is you can put a crosshair anywhere or a box if you want to make it bigger, and you can say what does the sky look like at any particular wavelength in any field of view in 2D if I back up and look at this 3D view as if I'm looking at it from Earth. Okay? I just want you to sit for one second and understand how amazing that is. Okay? So like, you're in this 3D immersive environment. You could be anywhere in the universe, but then you back up and say, oh, what's my earthbound view of that? And I'd like to have special goggles that let me see at any particular wavelength. Oh, and with any particular telescope, including all of the great observatories. This happens to be Spitzer, um, but that could be also a, a James Webb image. And so uh, <laughs> I don't know what happens in this video. I actually thought it was a still. Yes, okay, so when you go far enough from Earth, the view from Earth disappears um, because it becomes irrelevant. And this is just showing you that you can do the same thing where you understand that these two clouds um, are on opposite sides of a bubble. So this is incredibly fun, and one of the next things we're gonna do, that's why I showed you the picture with the Merge Cube, is actually also make it so that you can control the visualization um, with this in your hand. So I'm happy to talk more about that later. Okay, and so just for fun, let me show you what a really, really fancy plotly output looks like uh, when you wanna have a very rich interactive figure in nature. Okay, so remember I told you this is the Radcliffe wave, right? Remember I told you somebody asked if it was oscillating? Oh, <gasps> it is. <laughs> okay, and this is actually uh, also uh, movable in three dimensions and all of the layers can be turned on and off and you can uh, interact however you like and then you actually can even have these buttons um, that show you additional possible models and um, you can show things about the migration of the Radcliffe wave. I think you get the general idea that there's a lot of functionality and I want to get a little bit more toward the software and then be done in a few minutes. So what other things uh, has Glue now led to? And that's what's in this box over here. So I'm just gonna tell you a little bit about these various software efforts, and then we're gonna remind you that later I'm gonna share with you uh, this Google Drive full of examples. So do any of you work in biology or biotech or life sciences? A few people in the back. Okay, so you may have already guessed uh, that glue would be useful um, in genomics research. And the people at the Jackson Laboratory uh, guessed that a few years ago. 
And we have partnered with them through mostly Glue Solutions, which is the spin-off company of Glue. And by the way, I should explain that that is a for-profit company that is dedicated to giving 50% of its proceeds to open source software. I confess at the moment that those are glue-related projects, the giving away money, but someday when we're as rich as Tableau, uh, we will give away all of the 50% to, uh, to other projects. But anyway, so for the moment, this is uh, a partnership that way. And just to give you some idea, again, this is the high dimensional data, and so this is the same kind of screenshot I would have shown you for astronomy, but there are very different diagrams available to the geneticists where you can actually see things like a 3D model of DNA and clustering analyses and these linkage diagrams. And again, for those of you who are biologists, I think you understand that it's, it's really powerful if you can link um, different data sets together, especially in different formats without merging them. And the next thing that we're doing is actually working on something called spatial transcriptomics, which is the direct analogy of what we do in astronomy. So here you can see that they have images at various points in the image. They have actual data about a sequence at every point in the image. We have spectra or a th third dimension of another kind at every point in the image. Anyway, from a kind of philosophical, topological, mathematical point of view, the challenges are exactly the same. So it's, it's really a lot of fun um, to move from astronomy to biology, a lot of these um, tools. And I'm just going to flash these uh, names of um, data sets and data formats up here for those of you who care. Uh, about what it is that's going on in glue genes and tell you that uh, this spatial transcriptomics is on our roadmap and what comes next is in this blank box. And so if you'd like to talk to me about this later, um, please make suggestions of what you would like to see next. Okay, and then there's this whole raft of things that come under the title Glupiter. And again, because I don't have time to demonstrate each and every one of them, there's this whole a uh, folder full of um, examples, but for now I'll just explain that these different projects essentially represent different levels of interaction that you want. It's not necessarily about the sophistication of the user, it's a little bit like that, but sometimes even a very expert user wants a very low level, casual, quick interaction. So these are just different ways um, to think about using glue in, in Jupyter environments, okay? And by in Jupyter environments, I mean mostly Jupyter environments running online um, as opposed to, to locally. Okay, and so uh, Cosmic Data Stories is what Cosmic DS stands for here. And this is a program that was funded by the NASA SciAct group uh, for many millions of dollars, actually, where we're using Glue and Worldwide Telescope in the background to create a totally web page-like environment where nobody sees anything that looks like Jupyter Lab or Glue, and they just Everything is under the surface. I can show you a video of that in a few minutes if you'd like. Um, and then the next level up is kind of this dashboard experience where you can't make the sort of mess that I showed you when I showed you Zhuao and Catherine and me looking at the data. And you have just a particular dashboard that you can see. And then the top level is what we're working on with Sylvain uh, and, and friends from Quantstack, uh, which is a fully flexible, scriptable, extensible version of basically glue in a browser uh, using Jupyter Lab. And I'll just tell you that here at this website that's called Dimensions of Discovery, um, that links to basically all of these tools, and it takes a little while to load, but you can go there later and you can play with some large fraction of what I've already told you today, um, including things I haven't shown you, other Plotly figures, but here, um, this one, uh, oops is the website for the cosmic data stories. And let me just show you just a couple of seconds of this so that you can get the idea. I'm gonna turn off the sound. Um, but you get the idea that this is something that looks completely like just a website. And these are you know, embedded worldwide telescope views, which in the end are linked to uh, tables and to graphics. And the students are looking at their own data and then putting that in context of their class's data and ultimately of everybody's data uh, who's ever used the tool. Okay, so there's lots more I could say about any of those things, but let me just show you quickly a preview. Uh, and Gabriella um, made this excellent uh, user experience design with a lot of collaboration with Glue users. So this is a mock-up of Glue in a Jupyter Lab environment, and this is a demo that we have online 
concerning airplanes flying over Boston, but you can see uh, kind of how people would interact with the data, how panes would be laid out, um, and then uh, there's a new idea about how to do data linking, and I'll just show you that in the next video. Let me just, I think, yeah. Um, in the next video, you can see um, actually uh, something our QuantStack friend sent us last week, um, which is some of this uh, actually working. So this is now not a mock-up, but this is just a little section showing the linking architecture um, actually working in uh, Glupiter, in the, in the full-blown version of Glupiter. Okay, so now I want to just get to the very last piece of what I wanted to say about what we might discuss, okay? So this is what we want to do next, okay? So this is a project we have that involves time tag data and ways to lay that out and a metadata standard for that. This is a project we just were asked to do, essentially, by Microsoft, which still amazes me, where we're linking the archive of all astronomy literature to the chat GPT engine, um, and then we're going to have to find a way to interestingly display uh, visual results of what we find. Um, and then this is a website uh, that it gives people advice about visualization. And all of these things are linked here. So this is the chat GPT proposal. This is the 10 QViz. And then this thing is the interactive um, timeline software. But we, we are curious about the uses for building timeline software into uh, Glue. But I just wanted to show you this. This is actually also a real poster. This is from a different part of my life where I research and teach about the history of prediction. Um, this is something called the path to Newton. And if you ask the best question, by the way, you get this, okay? Um, so the path to Newton shows you everything that Isaac Newton would have needed to know or would have been confused by uh, in order to make his predictive theory of gravity. And this, this is just a slide from a talk I gave last fall for a bunch of science writers. And the only part I wanted to show you, and this is the last thing I'm gonna show you and then I'm going to end, is this idea of whether or not computers are the new telescopes. And the reason I showed you the path to Newton is because if you look here, this says prevailing belief, what tools were available and what math was available. And then you get to Newton, and eventually we are also making the path to Einstein, but let's just think about the future from you know, 1700 on, and you know, are computers the next telescopes? Well, you know, first we had computers, then we started using it for numerical simulation, then suddenly it was possible to actually implement Bayesian statistics, and now the kind of interactive data visualization um, that I'm talking about, and the AI and machine learning that I just hinted at. So I think that computers are the new telescopes, or the additional telescopes, and that I think, I hopefully have shown you that we see the universe more clearly uh, with glue and glupiter. And I want to thank these people and the 80 other people I haven't had a chance to thank um, during the talk. And I thank you all for listening and not opening your laptops. Thank you. And I know there's probably coffee outside, but I'm more than happy to answer a couple of questions. Hi, Alyssa. Um, we met several years ago. Rick Wagner. Hi, um, Rick. Uh, and I'm, I'm, something about this feels very familiar, and it's probably the name Thomas Robitaille. Um, was the glue code originally came out of the VO activities? No. It was not, it's not the hub desktop code? Absolutely not, no. Okay, because there was. <laughs> No, there was a SAMP, Simple Application yes. Message Passing, which was a very interesting idea about having all of these programs running independently, simultaneously, and talking to each other. And now there is the IVOA, the International Virtual Observatory Alliance, has actually extended that SAMP protocol. Um, and some of the tools I've shown you can also interact through that, which is actually why I had put that little footnote just for you <laughs> on uh, this slide, I think it was. Right, so there, there's your answer. It's this thing on the bottom. Thank you, it was Sam that I was thinking of. Yeah. Um, and if we're right about it. Okay, but, but that was a very good idea. It was actually originally called plastic, and then it became SAMP. And then, so philosophically, glue is similar to that, except that everything is actually running in one place. We have time for one last question. For the break. 
just one. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, I was wondering if th the last thing you showed, the prediction X thing, oh, yeah. you were getting insights or interest into how uh, computers and AI the most uh, is biasing our view of the world, and if you can address how these kind of charts of discoveries thing are probably awfully male-dominated and, um, you know, Western world-centered, et cetera, et cetera. Yes. Um, the answer is yes. Uh, we think about that a lot. Um, and I, I actually, this project involves about 50 faculty and researchers now, mostly at Harvard, but also in other places in the world. So there's tons and tons of interviews and things like that. But we also teach an on-campus class using the material. And this is uh, just from the, the blog of the website, predictionx.org. And if you go here, you can actually see the students talking about exactly those questions. And so all I can say is that I'm trying in my little tiny way uh, to, to have Harvard students think about the biases that can be introduced, um, you know, mostly by the training data and by people um, not using things uh, uh, wisely. And I should also say that we wrote a paper, uh, Responsible Big Data Research, I think it is. Uh, so we have two of these 10 simple rules papers. One of them is called 10 simple rules for the care and feeding of scientific data. I really hate that you have these things. Um, anyway, uh, and this one is called 10 Simple Rules for Responsible Big Data Research. And this one has some hints of the problems that can occur with bias in AI, but this was written in 2017. So I kind of feel like we need an updated version, you know, comma, especially with AI. Um, but yes, it's a huge problem, and I, I recommend that um, blog if you want to see what students are thinking about it. Okay. Thank you. Please give a round of applause to, to Alisa. It was amazing. <laughs> <laughs>